something that I promise can change your life more than even if you won the lottery. So we need to pay attention to what God's word says today. It's about something that is truly life-changing. By the very nature of it, it is life-changing. What we're going to see is that people have a serious problem. Like each of us are born with this serious problem. Uh, and that we need to be saved from that problem. There's only one way for that to happen. So if we fail to listen to God's word today, then we're ignoring something that's a matter of life and death. So would you open with me to Ephesians 2, 1 through 10? Uh, if, you, if you need a Bible, you can grab one from the back. Um, thanks, guys. Ephesians 2, that's in your New Testament. After Galatians, go. a small little, go eat popcorn. yeah, go eat popcorn. No, I still do that. Yeah. <laughs> if you need a Bible, you can just throw your hand up. Okay. If you can find the, the letter you, for the book, you can okay. go to the table of contents from the beginning of your Bible. <laughs> So one primary focus, Paul is writing to believers uh, in, in a certain city, and he's writing to them about how they walk. That's one focus of the passage. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I walk like this. I've actually been told I have a bit of a funky walk. Uh, I remember in high school, any time that I felt like someone was watching me walk, 
I would get particularly weird about the way that I walk. Hey, but have you ever commented on my walk? Yeah. <laughs> so, so it's like, even right now, I know that you guys are paying attention, and I'm super weird about my walk, and I'm focusing on the way that my foot hits the floor. Yeah, I've been told that. Like, like whenever I'm really excited about something, my feet are hardly touching the ground. I used to like skip around a little bit. Like, yes, we're going to class psychology today. Awful. My dad walks like a cowboy. It's really annoying. He what? He walks like a cowboy, like holds his hips. Your dad's awesome. So Your dad's awesome. Do whatever you want. So, so how do we walk? That's. To us, that just sounds like how are we walking? Uh, we're gonna we're gonna look at what that oh ah! comes over. Uh, we're gonna look at what that means a little bit. Keep that in your mind. How do we walk? So the first half is who are we? Of this whole letter, and it's a short little letter. Uh, what we do in church is we kind of break it all up and dissect it, and we encourage you to like read a chapter at a time or whatever. But these guys would have just gotten this letter, read through it all as if I wrote a letter to Zach, they wouldn't have any problem spending 20 minutes to read something that I wrote that I passionately went over and was like, Zach, this is how you need to live your life to follow Jesus. If I sent any of you a letter, if I was like, Silas, here's this letter, you would read it. You would be like, okay, let me go home and read this. It wouldn't be a problem. You wouldn't say, what if he, do I really need to like, this sentence right here, I need, to, I need to spend a week on this sentence. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I do that all the time. But the point is, this is a whole letter. It's one train of thought. And the first half, he focuses on who they are now that they've been saved. And in the second half, in chapter uh, 4, he starts to change to how they should live according to Jesus. All right, let's start in our passage. Hopefully you're there by now. That's Ephesians 2. So Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins. I'm going to do the very thing that I just talked about, where we break it up a lot and look at what he's saying. So you were dead in the trespasses and sins. That's a weird thing to say to somebody. Hey, Zach, you were dead! <laughs> But it's true. So he starts out with this radical statement to these believers. You guys used to be dead. He's talking to Christians. You used to be dead. He's talking. You used to be dead in the trespasses of sins. What does it mean to be dead? Uh, well, it means that you, well, we think about today, and it's like a corpse lying on the ground. That's a dead person. Somebody who's uh, without thought, without the ability to think or to feel or to touch or whatever. Um, so unresponsive, and it's getting harder to define what that means as technology advances. <laughs> but yeah, it's like, can you freeze my brain and my heart for a thousand years and wake me up? I don't know. I'm pretty sure that uh, it's weird, right? Yeah. Yeah. But the point is, dead people. They don't recognize God as good, and they are not devoted to him. One person said that they are blind to Jesus Christ's glory, they're deaf to the voice of the Holy Spirit, and they have no real love for God. They are as unresponsive to him as a corpse. That's what Paul is talking about. He's not saying you are physically dead. He's talking about something else. He's talking about spiritual death. He's talking about them being as unresponsive to God and his goodness as if they were a dead person. So this is not the same as being spiritually neutral. This is not just, I don't know him. Uh, this, this is not just, uh, I'm neutral and I can like be a good person to determine whether or not I am good. Uh, this is, no, if if you are not made alive by Jesus, we'll talk about soon, uh, then spiritually you're dead. One or the other, there's no in between. I'm just going to make that really clear here. So let's keep on reading. This is uh, from verse 2. Now I'll read verse 1 for context. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins 
in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. So how do you, he uses this word, walk? You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Now you all know I walk funky now. You know that about me. You're gonna probably look out for it. Right? <laughs> but how we walk means something much different than this in this passage. In our mind, we imagine a walk and it's like taking a little stroll along a beach. Maybe we're looking out and it's like a casual thing. When we're walking, we're not usually in a panic or in a hurry. There's peace with us. Um, Paul had something different in mind. Whenever he says, in which you once walked, it's referring to the entire way, your entire direction in life. What is your goal? What, where are you heading? What are you following after? And he makes that really clear because he says that we're not walking alone. It says that we're following a few things, three things. And this verse has two of them. First, we're following the course of this world. Paul speaks in weird words sometimes. This whole thing so far. You were dead. You were walking, following the course of the world. I don't know why. What's up with him? But <laughs> the point is, the course of the world. Look at where the world is going. Nowadays, people are always talking about like the world's so messed up. I hear that from people a lot. Like, where is our world? going? What's our world come to? And his point is that non-believers, those who have not been saved by Jesus, those who have not put their faith in him, uh, they are spiritually dead and following that. Whatever the world wants, whatever the world deems as good, uh, what the world says we should chase after. That's his point. He says that we're following something else. He says, following the prince of the power of the air spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Prince of the power of the air, there he goes with language again. Uh, prince of the power of the air. He's not a king. He's not King Jesus. Uh, but he is a prince. He does have power. Prince of the power of the air. Uh, and then it <coughs> refers to him as a spirit. The spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Uh, so this is referring to Satan um, and that air refers to the the place where, in, in the Bible, it talks about, uh, like, the heavenly places, the places where uh, spirits dwell, the places where they travel and communicate and influence. Uh, we see that in, later on in Ephesians 6, he's going to refer to those who we wrestle with, so who we're really fighting, and it, he calls them the evil forces in the heavenly places. It's the same sort of idea. This is Satan. This is referring to Satan. And what it says is that non-believers are following him. So that is different from saying that they're neutral. And this is kind of a radical thing to think about. It's similar to whenever Jesus was on earth in John 8, he, he was speaking to some people, and this is what he says. You are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Now, these were Jewish folk. Uh, they were not in their free time saying, let's go worship the devil. Uh, they were not like satanic cultists. Uh, but he told them, you are, you are of your father, the devil. The point is, if you have not been made alive by Jesus, uh, then you have been captivated you have been captured by the enemy through this world. That language is used elsewhere. This is a big deal. This is a big deal. Again, not spiritually neutral. It's not just uh, it's not just like I can do good things and become a good person since I'm really whatever. I'm not against God or for him. I'm just kind of in the middle. That's where most people would say that they fall today. I'm not with God or against him. I'm just kind of in the middle. This passage does. Okay, verse 3, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and 
were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. <coughs> so he's going to finish talking about non-believers here. And what he says is that they're following a third force, that is the flesh. The body, the mind, it's another weird idea. And what it means, the flesh in this sense, is the natural incl inclinations of the whole person to oppose God's will and his ways. Um, so it is the, the natural, human, bad side of me that doesn't want God. It's the side of me that wants to do sin. And Paul makes this clear in Romans 7 that once we're saved, this doesn't go away. We're no longer a slave to it, but it still dwells within us. Sin still dwells in me. Um, and, and I'm not just instantly uh, made perfect morally. So we still have the flesh, um, but he's saying that we used to follow it in a way that's different from how, non -believers, how believers do. He also says we're by nature children of wrath. Now this is uh, this is interesting. It says that non-believers were by nature, or he's talking to believers, and he says that before <coughs> you had life in Jesus, you were children of wrath. Now wrath is not a popular topic. God's wrath. That's not a popular topic for me. I don't hear it preached on very often. Uh, Zach says. Zach's faithful. Uh, but what we see in the scriptures is that there is sin, and that sin is a really big deal. Um, that sin is the stuff that hurts God. It's the stuff that hurts people. It's the reason why we look at the world and say that it's such a bad place. It's the reason that people feel pain. Uh, the reason for suffering is because humans have put it there. Humans, and I'm a human, I'm a part of that. I've contributed to the pain in the world. And God is good, holy, justice, and he can't have that. It would be outside of God's good character to allow bad things to continue happening forever and to not do anything about them. So that's where God's wrath comes in. He is angry about that. This is a righteous anger. This is looking at injustice against vulnerable people and saying, that's bad. And I'm angry about that. And I will do something about that. And God's plan to fix the world is uh, Jesus, when he returns, end of this age, uh, he will look at everybody and determine, did you put your faith in me? And if the answer to that is yes, they will go and live with him forever. And if the answer to that is no, uh, then, then his blood does not cover them, and God's wrath will be poured out on that person eternally in heaven talk about hell, we talk about heaven and hell, and it seems like God is against hell, or that it's this thing that he's not in control of, but no, hell is actually good news for the believer, and it's the worst news for those who will suffer there, uh, but for, for the believer, it, it assures that we will have peace in heaven, it's God's way of removing sin from the world, and having justice. I'm sure you have thought about this a lot, and it's the only way that God can have peace, can create peace, and still have justice on his hands. But that means that it's possible to live our whole lives having a great time here on earth, and living for whatever we want, following ourselves, like this said, and then die and end up in hell confronted by our maker and realizing that we were not on his side for our whole life. There's this quote by uh, Charles Spurgeon. He said, 
if you haven't looked at Christ on the cross, you'll have to look at him on the throne with great trembling. The sacrificial death of Jesus will be brought before the eyes of all who refuse to accept his free gift of forgiveness and eternal life. On the day of judgment, there is nothing we can do if we have not trusted. So I plead with you, don't live your whole life on earth for yourself. Live your 80 great years here and then die and find out it was all pointless. That's the summary of the book of Ecclesiastes in the the Old Testament is that life apart from God is meaningless. It's really fun while you're doing it. This guy Solomon had everything that he ever wanted. Very rich, very smart, had like so many wives. He had whatever he wanted, any kind of worldly pleasure, any sort of satisfaction that he could ever hope of. And then he looked at it at the end and he said, wow, that was all pointless. What was I doing? It wasn't for God. And I don't want you to end up the same way. I'm worried. scary idea. I don't want that to be true. So I beg you, consider what we talk about today. Let's continue on Ephesians 2 verse 4. But God. Now this whole passage has been pretty uh, melancholic at this point. Uh, it's been sad. It's been about like living poorly, uh, following Satan and the world and yourself, uh, and it's been totally absence of God in the universe. But this introduces God in the person. This verse, the whole paradigm shifts. It says, "But God, keep in mind we've done everything bad up until now, and then let's read again. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which He loved us." So the sinners in verses 1 through 3 could only anticipate God's wrath. It's all that we can hope for. Those who are spiritually dead. And that was all of us, and that's some of us today, perhaps the majority of us. That's all that we can anticipate is God's wrath. And there's no hope. And then God steps in the picture and says, but God has mercy. What does he do? Let's read verse 5. It's... uh, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, we have been saved. This is perhaps one of the most radical statements in your Bible. It says, even when we were dead. So when we were in that state against God, it wasn't neutral. It was uh, a state which was against him. Romans 8 makes that clear, the, the mindset on the flesh is hostile to the word of God, as opposed to the mind on the spirit, which is life. Uh, yes, Lord, talk to us. <laughs> um, but this here says that when we were dead in our trespasses, when we were in that state against God, he made us alive with him. The point being, God is willing to save dead sinners. If I was a great like battle hero who won a bunch of wars and I was like in charge of awesome things and I had all these enemies that wanted to kill me, uh, would I have mercy on them? I don't know if I would. If I had all the power in the world and these people adamantly hated me and my people, would I would I forgive them? I'd like to say yes, but I, I don't think so. You can multiply that by a million, uh, the severity of that, and that's what God is doing here. He is forgiving us while we deserve no forgiveness. I was dead, but God made me alive. I was against him. God gave me the ability to be for him. 
these people could not save themselves. That's true for you. Too. So don't ever think that you can do this apart from faith. This being made alive, this is the opposite of death. Think about it. You are made alive for the first time. That doesn't happen when you're born. You're spiritually alive. I'm sorry, you're physically alive when you're born. You live your life, but you're not alive spiritually until Jesus saves you. That means that you can be dead while you're living, and everything would be pointless. But for the first time ever, people are living. That's, that's radical. This means that they can see Jesus Christ's glory. They can hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. And they can have real love for God. They're rescued from their slavery to these forces. Let's keep reading. Now, plus the first thing that God did while we were in that state, he, uh, he, he made us alive. But it's going to say that he did two other things. Verse 6. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ so those who were spiritually dead, he makes spiritually alive, and then he spiritually raises them up. So it's like, I'm laying in my coffin, right? And then my eyes open, he made me alive. And then he raises me up out of the grave, and then he sits me down in a chair. Would you throw up that video? Lottery Not the lottery one. Dang it. It's a different one. <laughs> uh, some context for this, I was at a friend's house the other day, Emma, they've got a little boy, uh, and, and he watches these worship videos, and it's for little kids, but it touched my heart. So <coughs> don't think I'm just like, you guys are children, and you can watch these little kids. songs. It was like, I was a little kid. So let's watch them. <laughs> Where you just have a heart for children. Yeah, I do have a heart for children. Where you feel long, I want to show. 
affections. Every single one of us has a seat at the table of our great King, Jesus Christ. He calls each and every one of us and offers to carry all our worries so that we can then have a seat at his table. So, I think this can help us understand a little bit what he means here. Because uh, he says that God made us alive, if we have faith in Jesus, by grace we're saved. So you're made alive, and raised up, and seated with Jesus. Now, just like Mephibosheth was seated with King David, we are seated now we watched that, and I heard one of you, I think it was a girl, say in the beginning, that's so sad. It is so sad. His whole life was ruined. This is a real dude in the Bible, and he, his whole life was ruined. Dropped as a baby during this fight that goes on, and he can't walk. Oh, right. Yeah, <laughs> paralyzed. Yeah. He can't walk right. His whole life is ruined, and he lost his family. What do you do about that? Well, a good king called him. He was brought. He was raised up. And he was seated at his table. That is exactly what God does for those who have faith in Jesus. Their whole life is ruined. They might think it looks excellent for the time being. But at one point, they hit a breaking point and realize, that they are in utter need of a savior because they can't walk right. They can't walk the way that God made them to walk. They can't live the way that God made them to live. And they are in utter need of a savior just like a people show. And what does the savior do? He makes them alive. He raises them up. So right now, Jesus is not physically in his body in front of me for me to see. But it is though as I it is as though I am sitting with him right now. I am in an intimate relationship with him. Think about it like you're sitting across the table. I don't know if you guys are groomers anymore. It's like sitting across a table at a coffee shop, talking to a friend. We are seated with King Jesus, brought into his family, and seated, seated with him. We are sitting with him. Um, so spiritually, we are with him now. Sit in close place. Yeah. I hear you. <laughs> so this is radical. Uh, let's look at what else happens. We're drawing closer to the end. We're just going to verse 10. Don't panic. Verse 7, let's read. So that, this is the reason that he did it, so that in the coming ages he might show the, the immeasurable riches of his great and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So God did all of that to show his great and kindness. We're going to talk about grace. But this is only by his grace. This is only by his undeserved so, uh, anyone know the difference between grace and mercy? What's grace? Yeah. Grace is something that is given to us um, that we don't deserve. Yes. And something good something given good to us that we don't deserve. Perfect definition. And then mercy is like having, like, um, like no mercy. Like, okay. So, like, like in war, like yeah. for example, like like I'll have mercy on you, like I won't kill you. Like, okay, so um, not giving you something that you that, do deserve. Yeah. yeah, so something that would probably harm you or that you wouldn't like that you do deserve. So if I, if Zach deserves to die, and I'm gonna kill him, but I say I'll have mercy on you, 
that would be me not giving him something that he deserves to get. And then if I give him a bunch of gifts and presents, that would be me giving him something that he doesn't deserve, but is a gift. Hope that makes sense. Uh, the point is, grace is God giving us something that we don't deserve. Grace is not just like him giving you something physically, but an action toward us that you don't deserve. Another way to phrase that is his undeserved kindness. So for God to be kind to us when we do not deserve it. And he says that the reason that he raises us up and seats us with him is to show his grace and kindness. Let's read verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It's the gift of God. I'm going to reread that quote from before. If you haven't looked at Christ on the cross, you'll have to look at him on the throne with great trembling. The sacrificial death of Christ will be brought before the eyes of all who refuse to accept his free gift of forgiveness and eternal life. On the day of judgment, there is nothing we can do if we have not trusted Christ. My question to you all today is, have you answered Jesus' call and told him that you want to follow him as Lord and Savior? Because this here says, for by grace, that's that word, that undeserved kindness. For by grace you have been saved through faith. So all of it is by grace. And how does it happen? Through faith. So through faith, we are made alive, raised up, and seated with Jesus. That's the, that's the thing that happens when Christ is having grace and he's showing grace. So all of that is an act of God's grace, and it happens when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. That's the only way that it happens. Paul makes that really clear here. We were following the world. We wanted all of the sin, whatever. We didn't want God, and he made us alive. And that only happens by faith. So how are we saved? through faith, by grace. He goes on, this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. Think about a gift. Uh, I don't know if any of you have gotten like a really cool present. Uh, I have. I got some cool presents. And I think the best gift I've ever gotten was the Lego Death Star. Uh, my grandma spoiled us. She had like some excess money that she guess she wanted for that. So she bought us she bought me this. <laughs> Not your brothers. Yeah. This Lego set that was like four hundred dollars. That's wow. yeah, crazy. And it's like fifty of the coolest thing ever. And it had all the mini figures that I could ever want. It had Darth Vader. Had dark Sidious, the guy that's like, do it. <laughs> Come, yeah, do it. Changes. Yeah, it yeah. Uh, <laughs> the late Emperor Palpatine. <laughs> it's so cool. <laughs> and there's all the red dudes with their like, I'm gonna get a giddy right, 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 I don't have it. Too. Yeah, red dudes, those same. guards. Uh, that was an awesome gift. And when I got it, I remember literally like running out of the room. Yeah, like, ah! Ah! No. I was so excited about that gift. And you know what I had to do? I had to say, thanks, Grandma. I'll take this Death Star. Of course I will. My life right now is void of a Death Star set. I do not have this, and I want it. Thank you. I'm going to build this and I love it, and I'm going to go tell people that I have a Death Star. Mom, Dad, Grandma bought me a Death Star. 
So I didn't have it. She offered it to me, and I said yes. That is what a gift is. What do you have to do to get a gift? Be alive. Yeah. Do I have to like? Hey, I'll give you this gift if you're a really good person and dot 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 dot. That's not a gift. That's something that you earn. That's a reward. What is a gift? It is something that you did nothing for. That's why Paul uses this language. He's saying the only way that you get this gift is by placing your faith, your trust in Jesus Christ. So have you done that today? I, I beg you to answer that question truthfully because if, if not, then you will be face to face with Jesus in the future. And everything that your entire life has ever consisted of that was bad will be laid out in front of you. And you will be utterly convicted. You will be, you will realize for the first time how good God is and how bad you truly are. And then you will spend eternity apart from his kindness and grace. So make that decision now. Don't wait. That's the point. We are saved by grace through faith. By grace. says, this whole thing is verse 9, not a result of words, so that no one may boast. So how do we not receive the gift? Well, we don't receive it by being a good person. We don't receive it by going to church. We don't receive it by reading the Bible. We don't receive it by killing our sin. We don't receive it by praying every day. We don't receive it by evangelizing. We don't receive it by being kind or a good person. That's not how we are saved. Those are all good things, but they don't save us. So if someone asks, are you a Christian? And to answer that question, you say, yeah. And they're like, well, why? Why are you a Christian? And you say, well, I go to church most Sundays. I always go on Christmas and Easter. And I pray before my meals, and sometimes before bed. Um, I gave money to that homeless guy. I'm kind at school. People look to me as a role model. And I read my Bible with my dad, my mom, most of the time. If that's your answer to that question, if you're going to anything like that to answer the question, are you a Christian? Are you saved? I promise you those things don't save you. And you will utterly fall short. That is how you are trying to receive. Let's verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in. Paul clarifies, so this is our last verse, Paul clarifies that those things are good. They are good works, that's why they're called good works, but they don't save you. You can't boast because they can only come from you being saved. So, should we do all those things? Yes. But can we do them apart from Jesus? No, we, we can't. They're not good. It is only the one who recognizes the need for Jesus who will be born again. Paul uses this word again, walk, that we should walk. So he starts out by saying that we were walking, following all the bad stuff. He ends saying, so that we should walk in the good stuff. That's Paul's point. How are you walking? And are you alive? Living people follow Jesus. Living people follow Jesus. Only those who receive God's gift of salvation can have true life. Now, why should I care about this? Well, just like winning the lottery, your entire life changes. 
everybody wants to answer this question. What is the purpose of life? What is our purpose? I was listening to a podcast with Elon Musk on it, and they asked him, are you a Christian? He was like, well, or like, are you religious? And I think he said, well, everybody wants to answer the question, what's the meaning of life? And I feel like the purpose of life, well, there's probably a God, or something like that. Um, we want to answer that question, what is the purpose of life? And without Jesus, there is no good answer to that question. So the, the answer to, do you want to place your faith in Jesus, should absolutely be yes. Because if your faith is not in him, you have nothing. There's no meaning, there's no purpose. We are living for nothing. We all know that we want to be here. So what should we do next? Um, and I'm going to... Is that, is that a fact then? Or... or the okay, we can do Okay, let's do it. Um, so what should we do next? Well, make sure that you have placed your faith in Jesus. It's the only way to life. If you haven't, uh, would you... Hey, boys, let's grow up. Uh, if you haven't placed your faith in Jesus, do that now. Pray this with me. Jesus, I, I know that... I am a sinner. I know that I've messed up utterly. I don't even know how much I've messed up. But I ask for your forgiveness. I believe what the Bible says, that you died for my sins and rose from the dead so that I can have life. I don't want to chase after sin I want to trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior. Amen. Now those words are not just magical on their own. They say something about your heart. And if you meant that when you said it, if you've ever meant that truly, that you want to follow Jesus, you want him to be Lord of your life, if you place your trust in him, Bible promises you that he has made you alive, he has raised you up, he has seated you with Jesus, just like David did. So we should live differently. We should walk in confidence for the rest of our life, knowing that he has saved you. Don't doubt him. His word is sure. Uh, would you pray with me? Father, I thank you so much for your goodness and your grace. That you would give it to us in our state of hopelessness. I pray that if any students here are considering this truth, that you could save them, that you're their only hope, that they would put their faith in you. And if they have done that, that they would believe you when you say that they are yours that you are for them for the first time ever, their life can look different. They can have meaning, they can have purpose. There's a point to the way that they're walking. They're not walking after nothing. They're walking towards you. And you're walking with them. Thank you, Lord. We love you. And in your name we say amen. I'd like for you guys to stand and sing this last song with us. Thank <laughs> you.